Saw the inequality last class, negative absolute value of x less than or equal to x sine 1 over x less than or equal to absolute value of x. And no matter if x is positive or negative, you get the same inequality. So I took a little algebra to show, but this inequality right here will be true for all x's, or at least we only care about all x's close to 0. When we take a limit, do we care about x equals 0? just close to zero. So we don't have to worry, oh, we're going to be divided by zero. Not really, because we're not actually going to plug in zero. All right, so we got this inequality. So what theorem did we just look at before this? Sandwich. There we go, sandwich theorem, or squeeze theorem, depending on uh, what book you're using or who you're talking to. So we got sandwich theorem. So the big thing I talked about theorems, you have to make sure you satisfy their hypothesis, and then you can use the conclusion. So what is a hypothesis? We'll scroll up a little bit. Dun, dun, dun. If. So it's what comes after the if before the then. So it goes if hypothesis, then conclusion. So I just need to say, is do we have a small, medium, a large function? And that's the whole reason we just set up that inequality. Is so we can say, oh, we got a small, medium, large function. So we're going to take the outside limits, and then the inside limit has to be between. So yes, we satisfied the hypothesis. I just underlined right there. So this, I'll write this in blue. You don't have to write this out. This is just a comment. So this is the hypothesis of the sandwich theorem. If you want, you could write, I think I went GFH. Uh oh. Yes. GFH, okay. So our little G of X is negative absolute value of X. F of X is that middle X sine one over X. And H of X is absolute value of x, and they're lined up. We got g less than or equal to um, x sine 1 over x. So everything I wrote in blue, you don't have to write down. These are just comments on ex very explicitly why I satisfied the hypothesis. So I call them the Goldilocks functions. You got small, medium, large function. So once you satisfy the hypothesis, you have to name the theorem. So you write by the sandwich theorem, by the sandwich theorem, sand, oops, sandwich theorem. So we got lim negative absolute value of x as x approaches 0, let us equal 2, lim x sine 1 over x as x approaches 0, less than or equal to lim x approaches 0, absolute value of x. All right, so that is the sandwich theorem. You got your small limit and your large limit are going to bound your middle limit. So all I have to do is figure out what are these outside limits. Can you graph absolute value of x function? You should be able to, it's just the v function. So let's go ahead, and that, that's the one on the right. So let's take care of the right limit first. So absolute value of x, very easy to graph. What happens when x approaches 0? There we go, uh-oh. Connect it up so everything matches perfectly. All right, as x approaches 0, y approaches 0 right there. You can see it happening, both sides, doesn't matter. So as x approaches 0, y approaches 0 also. So that's our limit, absolute value of x limit. As x approaches 0 is 0. So we got 0 for that limit. All right, what about absolute value or negative absolute value of x. 
how is the graph different? So we just graphed absolute value of x. What transformation do I do to get negative absolute value x? Vertical flip or reflection. So all your positives become negatives, negatives become positives. So it will look like this. And this is y equals negative absolute value of x. And again, we just want to know about uh, close to 0. So the closer we get to 0 for x, the closer y gets to 0. So either side, we're going to be approaching 0. So I can write as x approaches 0, our y also approaches 0. So any questions on that graph, that limit right there? I'm just going to rewrite the middle limit. All right, what number is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 0? Zero. 0. Any other numbers have that property? Nope, that narrows it down pretty quickly then. It's greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 0. So it's got to be 0. So you can use a nice big word like thus. Lim x approaches 0. So our limit is 0. So that is the sandwich theorem. So that's the end of that section. We're going to go to our next, which is definition of a limit. So we know what this means, but we don't have a precise definition. So when I say this is what it means versus a definition, a definition is what exactly do we mean as x approaches c? So we want to get very precise about what does it mean for x to get close to c. We have some notion of what it means, but we want to have a very precise definition. So we're going to look at, well, how close do I need to be to c to get uh, f of x close to L. So we're going to look at what, is, what do we mean by close and approaching. So we'll do, so what we're going to do is pick, we're going to pick how far away we want to be from L, and then is it possible to get, uh, how close does x need to be to C to get f of x close to L? Uh, if that sun bothers you, there's, I think that white switch on the right controls the window. So whoever's sitting on your right, if you want, you can walk up and put the shade down. Let's go with our square root. How about that? So we'll do easy question. All right, so find this limit. You can use limit rules that I showed you. Really, the only rule you really need, you can write the power. You can write it like this. You could bring the 1 half power outside the limit. So this is the uh, exponent exponential rule, or the uh, power rule for limits. And of course, x approaches 4 of x is just 4. So you get square root 4, which is 2. All right, easy limit. So we're going to graph 
f of x equals square root x, and we're going to graph. We're really curious about 4. So let's go ahead and make our graph include the x value 4. And we just wrote down the limit is 2, so you can write as x approaches 4, f of x approaches 2. So what we're going to do now is look at, well, how close to 2 do you want to be? And then how close to 4 do you have to be to get there? So we'll write... So how close? So let's look right here. Around 2, what I'm going to do is build what's called a neighborhood hood right here. So I'm going to say go a little above the y value 2 and a little below the y value 2. So that distance we measure right there, we're going to call, well, let's just pretend it's 1 half right now. So I'll just say that's 1 half. Yes. Okay, so with this, that would work. You could go both ways, but the reason you can't do that with most is because it could cross to you at another point. Uh, let me answer that question very generally. A definition is differs from a theorem. A theorem has a if A then B, okay. and a definition is an if and only if. Okay. Uh, what definitions have you seen in this class so far? I don't think you've really seen any definitions, other than maybe I could say some of the trig, like what is cosine and tangent. I didn't really talk about what they are, just some properties, but you know, cosine is defined to be the x-coordinate on the unit circle that corresponds to the theta value. So that would be the definition of cosine. So definitions are... If I tell you this function, or the limit is 4, you know exactly what that means. Um, and also, if you could show the limit was 4, you could then say, oh, and the limit is 4. If you could use the definition and show that. All right, so I want to know how close do I have to be to 4 in order to get my y value within 1 half of 2. So if we look on the graph, what you can do is basically go across here. And then trace downwards. So how close to 4 do I need to be? I need to be right here this close. And what we're going to do is look at, there's two distances. They won't always be the same. There's actually two distances right here. And for this function, the left one's actually smaller, just because of the way the slope works. So it might be a little hard to tell in your picture, but the left, the left distance should be a little smaller than the right distance. They're pretty close, but the left one should be a little smaller. So what we're going to do is take the smaller of the two and make a neighborhood right here. So we'll call these distances A and B. How in the world do I figure out a and B. You see them up on the screen. How in the world can I figure out what A is? Can you go backwards from one and a half? So we're definitely going to use one and a half and then see. Where? So we're basically going to work backwards. So we're going to say what? So if I look at Y values, I got one. If I go decimals, I can go 1.5 and the top one will be 2.5. So I want to know what X value hits 1.5 what x value hits 2.5. And then that, very carefully, will tell me not a and b, but how the x value that I need right here. So I'll figure out that x value and that x value, and then subtract right there. All right, so we're going to look for a. So I want to find a. 
So we got 1.5. So what do I do? So I got basically f of x is 1.5. So that's our y value. So it's called f of x. So f of x is 1.5. What is f of x? Square root of x. How do I solve for x? Square both sides. Uh oh. 2.25, is that right? All right, that's not A, though. How do I find A? So do 4 minus 2.25, and that'll give me A. So I want to know the difference between 4 and where 2.25, and that's A. And 1.75. Questions on that right there. So I want you to find B right now, almost the exact same way. You're just going to use 2.5 and see where what x value hits 2.5. So find B. It's almost exactly the same. And I'll give you a minute to find this. Yeah, I chose, I chose my one half arbitrarily. Okay, so I mean, we could have chosen 1.25 and we would have been all. That range would have been larger. Correct? Yeah, you usually want to pick something pretty small. Okay. Uh, 1.75. Do we choose those or do you give those to us? I will give it to you. What we're actually going to do is we're going to put an epsilon there instead. We're going to put a variable and then work through it with a variable. I'm just keeping it all numeric so things are less, hopefully a little less confusing. What's 2.5 squared? 6.25. So what's wrong if I go 4 minus 6.25? So there, how, there's a few ways to fix it. I can subtract the other direction. But what if I don't want to spend time thinking about which one's bigger and smaller? Absolute value. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's go absolute value. And I don't have to worry about which one's bigger and which one's smaller. I'll just absolute value their difference. So you get 2.25 BB. So once we have these, I can say when X is inside the interval. So between So A is 1.75, 2.25, and 6.25. So what I'm actually going to do, instead of using 6.25, I'm going to use, I'm going to go the same distance. I'm going to take the minimum of these two distances right here. So I'm going to use the 1.75 for both sides. So my left endpoint is going to be 4.75. So I'm taking the smaller of those two. So my left endpoints, I'm going to use 4.5.75. I'm basically taking the smallest of the two and then going the same distance each direction. So I'm going to take the 1.75 and go left and right. So it won't go all the way to 6.25. So we got 2.25 comma 6.25. 
comma 5.75. All right, when x is in this interval, f of x has to be in the interval that we wrote down here, 1.5 to 2.5. Questions on this right here. We said if x is this close to 4, y is going to be within 1 half of 2. So we picked some area, a neighborhood around 2, and said what neighborhood around 4 does it take to get inside that neighborhood? Is there a question? Nope. It would have been true just as well. So I, I could have put right here, I could have put 6.25 instead. But the reason we're going to go this way is because I want to make it uniform so the same amount to the left as the right. So I want, I want to center it at 4, and what we're actually going to be doing is making a, a neighborhood around 4. That's the same distance both directions. Otherwise, you have to worry, well, if we're on the right, it's bigger, left is smaller. So it'll make it, the math a lot easier. All right, so I could have done the 6.25 there. Still would have been true, but this way keeps things what we call symmetric. So it goes the same amount this way as that way. All right, so we got our first example done. I still haven't told you the definition. So it's probably time to do that right now. All right, I don't see the exact definition of my notes, so I'll just make it up. All right, we'll go definition. Of limb x approaches c, f of x equals l. All right, so there's a definition right here. So we got two new Greek letters, epsilon and delta. Epsilon is a backwards three. And delta is a delta, and it sort of looks like D. Maybe it looks like a music symbol. Maybe, am I just thinking of that? Yeah, it looks like a delta. It's good enough. All right, any epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that If, so we'll write it, if x minus c is less than delta, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Oh, if then, that looks familiar. So here's another if then. All right, this is our definition. It's a good time to put a box around it. Is uh, delta and epsilon any specific? The only thing specifically they are are not zero and not negative. Okay. So that's all we know about them. Now, it has to work for any epsilon. What you're going to do is, for any epsilon, you need to find a delta that has this property. So that's how we're going to go about showing this. So for any epsilon greater than zero, you're going to find the delta with this property and then show you're correct. So you really need to memorize this definition. So I'm going to underline some words that maybe don't look that important. 
So this says for any, uh, any positive epsilon, there exists a delta. That's very different than saying for this one epsilon, uh, all these deltas work. Flipping it around is not going to work. We can look in our example. Uh, let's take epsilon to be one half. Delta is this 1.75 measurement right there. Does any value work right there? Any positive value? Will that get me within one half? No, you make it smaller, it goes too small, or not too small, too big. So you may have some really big delta way out here, and you're going to be way outside of two. So it's very important the order things go in. So what we did, we did not show for any epsilon. We showed for specifically for one half. How do we do it for one half? Well, this 1.75 is our epsilon for one half. So we showed only for one specific value epsilon, we found the delta for that value. So that's what we just did. Yep. So you're always going to get deltas here. And I can't really squeeze in an epsilon here, but I'll do it anyways. Those are epsilons right there. So it'll always be epsilons on the y's, deltas on the x's. I don't know exactly why those letters were chosen, but that's the way this, the letters everybody uses now. So we got an epsilon neighborhood in the y axis and a delta neighborhood on the x axis. <clears throat> so let's look at Yes. So you can also access just the notes without the YouTube videos. So if you uh, miss what I just did up there, you can always go back in the notes. And there's a link in Canvas. And you can, I think the notes should be updated almost instantly within a couple seconds of when I write. <coughs> so uh, you can always go back and look at the notes later if you're, if you're wondering that question. Like, oh, did he put delta on the x or the y axis? You can always come back. Yep. You can navigate through all the notes, yeah. All right, so we're going to look at uh, x minus c less than delta. What does that actually look like? Well, absolute value. If you had a good algebra professor or teacher, they would have told you. that absolute value inequalities turn into two separate inequalities. And multiply by negative 1. Oh, if I could write negative delta flip the inequality sign. I'm going to put the small thing on the left. And so we got x minus c is smaller than delta and greater than negative delta. So there's one way to. Th uh, no, because we didn't start out with equals. Uh, then I'm going to add c to both sides. So we get c minus delta. Less than x, less than c, plus delta. So this is the best way to think of the inequality. So wherever c is, you go delta to the right, and you go delta to the left. And this is c plus delta, c minus delta. So this is the way you want to think about that absolute value inequality. Can we choose any c that we want? And I'll tell you, like, Look, uh, you know, x is 5, or we did 4 for this one, for the example we just looked at. Uh, I mean, if I did a square root, it would make sense to pick probably 1, 4, 9, something like that, uh, as opposed to like 3. Uh, it's not, it just makes your problem a little uglier, that's all. So this is what we call delta neighborhood of C. So this is a delta neighborhood of C.
So we can go delta to the left, delta to the right, as long as we uh, stay within that, we're in our neighborhood of C. So this is what we mean by close. So if your x values come from this neighborhood, you're close to C. So this is what we mean by close. So when we say things that like x approaches c or x is getting close to c, what we mean is there is some delta neighborhood around c, such that if x is that close, then we can see our y in a very similar way. So our f of x will need to be within epsilon. So I won't go through all the same computations, but here's L. We go epsilon up, epsilon down. This will be L plus epsilon, and the other one's L minus epsilon. So this means F is close to L. So what does close to L look like in algebra? Just like what it is in the definition. So you scroll back up a tiny bit, and in the original, that means F of X minus L is less than epsilon. So that's the inequality up there near the top. F of X minus L less than epsilon. So that's what it means. So we have, and this is of course called epsilon neighborhood of L. But I don't think that's worth writing down. So. All right, so we're going to prove that the limit of square root of x as x approaches 4 is equal to 2. So we're going to look at the definition and then show that for any epsilon, we can find a delta. And it's not going to be, it's going to be sort of similar to what we did before. There are just going to be no numbers. It's all going to be epsilons, deltas. Well, there'll be 2 and 4 hanging around. But, but there's going to be epsilons and deltas. Yep. Um, will we have to type in epsilon and deltas into web work? You'll s uh, so how do we do that? So if we look at the definition, we don't get to choose epsilon. But we have to show whatever epsilon you got, this is a delta that's going to work. So at the very end, what we're going to get is a delta. We're going to say, here's what delta needs to be. And it's going to relate to epsilon. So we won't ever have to type in an epsilon or a delta symbol? It's going to be like numerical. It'll, they'll say, like, what is delta equal? And it will have an epsilon in it. Okay. Uh, and I think E-P-S-I-L-O-N is epsilon, but you can always Google it. Uh, it might be helpful to just print out a cheat sheet of Greek alphabet in case you're really bad at... T there aren't too many times I, I can remember that you need to type in all the actual Greek letters. Uh, <laughs> theta. Yeah, a lot of them will tell you. But... Yeah, theta, T-H-E-T-A, but if you just look up Greek alphabet and how to spell it, um, that's really good if you play Scrabble. You Greek letters, like Xi, X-I. You make some real people, people really mad if you start dropping you Greek. On a, on a triple word score. Yeah, it's in the dictionary and it's not capitalized. You get it. I think it's a rule in Scrabble. So if you know your Greek letters or words with friends, whatever you're into, Boggle, although it's not so epic in Boggle, because I think it's just whatever. Uh, who cares? That's a good game. All right, so we got to say any epsilon, we need to pick our delta that has this property.
Who? That should be a delta. X minus C should be less than delta. All right, so you're going to do something a little weird. You're actually going to start at the end and then work backwards. So you're going to start at the end of the definition, what you want to show, and then work backwards and figure out what delta has that property. So we're going to begin at the end, which is a little strange. So I can write, what is f of x, square root x, what is L2, so certainly you can see 4 makes this true. Epsilon is greater than 0, so what do we get if I actually plugged in 4 for x? 0. So hopefully your intuition will tell you if I go close enough to 4, I will be very close, this will be square root will be very close to 2, so I'll subtract and get a small number. But the question is, how close? So that's... <coughs> no, not definitely. Um, it'll depend on what epsilon is. So what we need to do, so our goal is to get the inequality x minus c is less than something. And of course, in our case, x minus c is x minus 4. And I'll be a little more, this something is going to be a function of epsilon. We already used f, so I'll go with uh, h of epsilon. So it's a function of epsilon over here. Oh man, how in the world can I figure out, how in the world do I turn square root x minus 2 into regular x minus 4? Almost. I mean what you know. How do I turn square root x minus 2 into regular x minus 4? So let's think of... So I'm not trying to find the x value that makes them equal. In fact, I'm pretty sure 4 makes them equal. So I'm not trying to find... I'm trying to transform, do some steps. So it, down here, I have x minus 4 less than, obviously the right side is going to change. So I could try to square, but I think that gives me, so if I go for squaring, let's look at what happens. I certainly, it's a valid move. This is not an identity. It's very different from an identity. I'm going to change both sides. So good news, squaring doesn't change our inequality unless things were negative. But epsilon's positive and absolute value is definitely not negative. So we get regular x minus 2 root x, 2 root x, 4 root x plus 4. All right. Unfortunately, that's not really what I want. So you FOIL, so you get a squared minus 2ab. So I do want to multiply by something, and it's not squared x minus 2. So don't worry about the letter h. So how about conjugates? What if we multiply both sides by conjugate? My favorite C word. Conjugate on the left, and then you better treat both sides fairly. Conjugate on the left, conjugate on the right. So let's get that square stuff out of there. 
So what I'm going to do, oops, better get the squares out. So I'm going to multiply by well, what happens if squared x plus 2 is negative? My inequality would flip around. Can that be negative though? Better not be. Square root plus 2 better not be negative or something crazy is going on. Square root has to be 0 or more. So add 2 to it, you're going to have positive. So if it could be negative, you want to go ahead and just throw absolute value around it. Like for example, if it was square root x, maybe minus 2, that could very well be negative. So then you throw absolute value signs around it. So I'm going to multiply to both sides. Now we multiply inside here. Square root times square root x times square root x is regular x. Outside inside terms are going to cancel. Remember conjugates a minus b times a plus b, a squared minus b squared. I think I've said conjugates enough times this quarter. Have I? Maybe I haven't. Is that my other classes? I think I've said it in a lot. All right. So this is conjugate right here. So if you multiply conjugates a minus b times a plus b, you get a squared minus b squared. Also known as difference of squares. So if you want to name it by using the right side, you call it difference of squares. If you want to name it on the left side, you call it conjugates. So I like to just stick with the word conjugates instead of difference of squares. So I'm going to foil this out. Squared x times squared x, regular x, minus, we'll go with a plus, squared x, 2 square root x, minus 2 square root x, minus 4. All right, those 2 squared x minus 2 squared x cancel out. So those cancel out to 0. So we got x minus 4 is less than, we can fill in the right side now, this stuff we just wrote down. Epsilon times Now, this problem is going to be way more difficult than the problem that I will give you on your midterm on Friday. So this week you got a midterm Friday. So I will give you a much easier problem that will pretty much be done at this moment. But our, unfortunately this example is more difficult. So how about let's stop this one, do an easier one, and then come back. So leave a bit of room, we'll do our next example. And we'll do an easy one this time. All right, so first of all, what is the limit of 2x as x approaches 4? This is easy. 8. 8. But the hard part is we have to show why this is 8. So it should be 8. We plug in 4. 2 times 4 is 8. But why is this 8? So let's go with, I'm going to rewrite the definition of a limit. I can fill in specific values. If x minus 4 less than delta, then 2x minus 8 less than epsilon. So I just filled in the c value and f of x and l. That's all I really know at this point. And of course, before it was 
that was x minus c, and this is f of x minus l right there. That's the differences that we made, or the changes we made. So I said you start at the end and then go back to the beginning. So we're going to start with the inequality 2x minus 8 less than epsilon. We're going to, oh, it's too far in, there we go. That on the screen. All right, we want to do some algebra and get down to x minus 4 less than something. How do I turn 2x minus 8 into x minus 4? So we will multiply by half or divide by 2. You're going to find that multiplying or dividing is a very common way to solve these. The harder part is the process. So multiply by a half. Do I have to worry about the inequality flipping around? Nope. Two is positive. Nope or half's positive, either way, uh, not going to change my inequality. All right, right there, that's our delta. That's all you have to do. You see delta right there. So that's delta. So all you have to do is say delta equals epsilon over 2. So whatever epsilon you pick, I'll just cut it in half, and that's my delta. So if you want to use one half, no problem. If your epsilon is one half, well, I'll just say delta is a fourth then. If you want a really tiny epsilon, maybe one tenth, no problem. I'll just say, well, one twentieth is going to be the delta. If you want a super tiny epsilon, one over a million, no problem. My delta is one over two million. So whatever epsilon you pick, no matter how small you make it, I just have to divide it by two, and that's my delta. So all you have to do is tell me delta. So in web work, the answer would be right there. Delta is this epsilon over 2. That would be your web work answer. They'll ask you, what is delta? So how does this relate to the graph to get some more intuition? 2x, easy function of graph. And we want an x value 4. And 8. Now the problem is, I didn't tell you what delta is, so I can write up a delta, but it's going to be a little misleading because it needs to be any number, not just the one that looks like I write down, or not delta. So I'm going to pick, I'm picking an epsilon. So all we had to do was look over here and figure out where did that make us land. So from this picture, can you see why? Epsilon over 2 is how far you're allowed to go over on both sides. Is there a way to find the slope and then use that on as linear functions, it's exactly related to the slope. The steeper your slope is, the smaller your delta is going to have to be. And if you're closer to being flat, you can actually have a really big delta. And um, you know, if your slope is especially you know, almost a flat line, when you go to measure it, you're going to have a huge, like a really tiny epsilon you're going to get a really big delta neighborhood like that. So it's the, I believe it's the reciprocal of your slope, basically. Yeah, because our slope is 2 over 1 right here. Uh, but that being said, you need to use the definition and go through. All right, so our, our specific delta is epsilon over 2. So if I label these, pretty hard to label it, so I'll just go. Our delta was epsilon over 2. And it was the same on both sides right there. So hopefully that'll give you some intuition as to you go any epsilon, and then you look at, well, what deltas would that correspond to?